Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Michael Rugel from the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. It's a pleasure to be here today with Jonathan Sandler. His, his new book is The English GI, World War II Graphic Memoir of a Yorkshire Schoolboy's Adventures in the United States and Europe. It tells the story of Bernard Sandler, Jonathan's grandfather, and it's based on Bernard's own memoir and written in the form of a graphic novel. Uh, Bernard's story is typical of a Jewish soldier serving in the U.S. Army in, in many ways. Uh, it's quite familiar compared to the stories we tell of the over half a million Jews who served in the American military, but it's quite unusual in that uh, Bernard Sandler only served in the U.S. Army because he went on a school trip. Uh, he became one of many non-citizens who were eligible for the draft and military citizen military service provided an expedited path to citizenship. And that group of served Jewish service members, those seeking citizenship, are something we talk about frequently here at the museum. But Bernard Sandler went through that path to American citizenship, but started from a much, much different point. So it's really been a pleasure learning his story and learning it in the form of this graphic novel. I'll ask people to uh, submit questions using the Q&A. Uh, after we're through the initial presentation, you can go ahead and start submitting questions using that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen anytime, but we will get to them after we're through the presentation. Uh, Jonathan Stanler studied politics at Leicester University and has spent a large part of his career working in software industry, leading and managing complex projects. Jonathan, a keen sketcher, has always been passionate about World War II history and graphic novels. In 2020, he combined these dual interests and commenced work on the English GI, which was published this year. He lives in West London with his wife and three children, where he joins us from today. Jonathan, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike, and thank you so much for the introduction and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my uh, grandfather's World War II experience and also my own personal journey in creating this unique graphic novel. Uh, yeah, I live in Golders Green in northwest London. Uh, with my wife, Jenny, and my three kids. Uh, Golders Green, for those that know it, is the heartbeat of the Jewish community here in London. Um, we attend uh, Golders Green Synagogue on Dunstan Road. Some of them, some of you may know that. Uh, my wife, actually, Jenny, is actually originally from uh, Palo Alto in California, and I've got family all over the United States. Um, I was actually recently, I was in New York and Stanford uh, only last month for my brother-in-law's wedding. Um, I, as I also I work for an American software company, um, so but this is very much my debut in the public publishing world, and um, I'm here to talk to you about my grandfather's memoir, the English GI. Um, now I don't know if this is the I'm pretty sure that this is the first graphic novel that uh, we've talked about here at the museum. Over I know there's been many amazing books. Uh, over the years, but this is, uh, I, I suspect, the first. Yeah, yeah the first, uh, the first speaker from for a graphic novel. Yeah, many book talks. This is the first one we've had based on a graphic novel. Great. So I'm just going to give a short presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, firstly, I just want to introduce you to my grandfather, Bernard Sandler. He, he was born a hundred years ago on the 18th of October, 1922. He grew up with his brother, Max, and his sister, Sonia. He had a very happy childhood growing up in Leeds. Leeds is a city in Yorkshire, 200 miles north of London. Um, he had a very traditional Jewish upbringing. He had his bar mitzvah at a synagogue called the Francis Street Synagogue in 1935. Um, he lived with his parents, Celia and Jaime, and his grandparents, Morris, and Gittel Hurst. So in August of 1939, he was almost 17 years old, and a friend of his from his school asked him to join him on a school trip to Canada and the United States. Now, August 1939, it was a precarious time in the world, and I think his parents pondered whether he should go on this trip. Um, he needed to persuade them, and they said yes. Uh, it couldn't have been an easy decision given the situation in Germany. Um, there were 20 children, uh, young adults from the north of England that went on this trip, uh, including two from his school. And they had an extraordinary time in, in, in uh, Canada and North America. And the last day of their, their trip was in 19, it was the 3rd of September, 1939. And at that point, 
Um, at, the, at this point, he was um, uh, Neville Chamberlain declared war. Britain had entered World War II, and he was unable to get home. Um, it was decided that due to the dangers of U-boats that Bernard would stay in the United States. And that is the dramatic start to, to this extraordinary story. 17-year-old Bernard had never even been to London, and suddenly he found himself living in New York City. This provincial boy from Northern England was now living in the cosmopolitan surroundings of New York. The art, the jazz, the theater, the liberal social views, it all had a profound impact on him. And it even shaped his future career in the theater production. So this begins his remarkable World War II adventure in the United States. And what makes Bernard's story so unique is that he was a British citizen fighting for the US Army. Now, this was uh, certainly at the beginning, this was extraordinarily difficult for Bernard. He was separated from his very close-knit family back in, back in England. Um, no phone calls, um, just letters and the odd telegram. He didn't even know if letters would get back to his family. The separation was deep, but it really was the making of him. So the question is, of course, how did my book actually come about? So. In 1994, um, my grandpa uh, was, um, he was in his early 70s. And like many people from his generation who had experienced the atrocities and the trauma of war, Bernard never really spoke that much about that period of his life. In 1994, it was the 50th anniversary of D-Day. And he decided to share his story uh, with the family. And he wrote his memoirs. This is the orange book on the on the left. And that must have been quite rare at the time. He printed maybe a handful of copies for family and close friends, which were read, appreciated, and then left on the bookshelves to gather dust. Bernard died a few years later in 1998 at the age of 75 after living a happy and fulfilled life. My son has a huge interest in World War II, and we started watching World War II documentaries as a family, all four of my children's uh, great grandfathers saw combat, uh, and their great grandmothers had interesting stories too. Um, and we all we are all in this day still amazed by how perfectly ordinary people were called to do extraordinary things uh, uh, during World War II. The kids were asking lots of questions about the lives and the war roles of their great grandparents. And I was luckily able to dig out my grandfather's book and reread his memoirs for the first time in 30 years. And upon doing so, I thought to myself, this is really an extraordinary story. It could be a film, but realistically, that wasn't going to happen. So I had a, an epiphany. I am going to turn his memoir into a graphic novel, and I'm going to do it by 2022 to mark what would be his 100th birthday. So why a graphic novel? Well, firstly, I'm a big fan of comics and graphic novels. I have been since a kid. But secondly, they are now, they're very, they're, they're accessible to a much wider audience of both adults and children. A graphic novel is a different reading experience and ultimately a quicker one, uh, arguably less daunting for the reluctant readers. The reality is, if I were to have produced a traditional book, that would have, although it would have been equally as fascinating, I didn't necessarily see the demand for it. So I thought that this was a unique way uh, to, to, to honor my grandfather and a novel idea worth pursuing. It was maybe a gut instinct and I decided, let's go for it. So the first thing, the first and most logical step in the process was to research World War II graphic novels and to see what, what else was out there. And I was surprised that whilst there was a few, there wasn't as many graphic novels as I had thought. Maybe I'd found a gap in the market. I just want to draw uh, the audience's attention to two specifically um, that I found quite inspirational. One was uh, They Called Us Enemy by George Takai. Uh, Takai is most famous uh, for being uh, Sulu in Star Trek. But in 2019, he wrote a fascinating graphic novel about his own 
um, harrowing experience uh, uh, during the Japanese internment by the US government after Pearl Harbor. Again, I thoroughly recommend this book. Um, and then of course, there's the masterpiece, um, uh, Mouse uh, by the American cartoonist Art Spiegelman, uh, where uh, Spiegelman interviews his father about his experiences as a Polish Jew and Holocaust survivor. It most famously portrays the Jews as mice, the Germans as cats, the Poles as pigs, and the Americans as dogs. I bought a number of graphic novels and decided on the type of style I wanted. Um, and I decided I wanted a fairly realistic style. So the next challenge was, well, how was I gonna do the novel? Um, I soon realized that I don't quite have the skills or the patience uh, uh, to, to draw the, the 300 frames required for the book. Um, after reaching out through a site, I was overwhelmed with interest um, and I received an email from an artist in Massachusetts he just simply said, I can help, your project sounds fascinating. And we headed off right away. Uh, a gentleman with the name of Brian Bicknell from a town called Ipswich in Massachusetts. We developed a very good working relationship. I would research images online and sketch out what I would see as every scene. Um, and one of the first decisions we needed to make was what was my grandfather going to look like in the book? I found a, there's a picture of him in 1937, he's wearing glasses. So we used him wearing glasses and just for consistency, um, he wears glasses throughout the book. Although in reality, I'm not sure if he did wear glasses all the time. That wasn't that important. The most important thing was, for, as I said, finding consistency for the reader. Um, it was as almost as if I'd found an actor to play my grandfather in this book. And this was to be his character throughout the story because the story really shows uh, Bernard coming of age. So over the next few weeks, my role, I was the director, the producer, the scriptwriter, all in one. I had the story, of course, written here, but then I had to work out how to actually convey the scenes and the narrative. There were very few photographs, of, if any, of my grandfather's World War II experience. And in some way, that was the funnest part of the challenge, was to research every single scene and find suitable images online to support each frame. Um, I needed to ensure that my illustrator had what he needed. For me, the details were so important. The signs, the background had to be authentic and detailed, whether it be in New York at the start of the book or when he is in the army late, later on. So I'll give you an example. Um, early on, um, he, ha he goes to a, a hotel in New York um, to meet uh, family friends called the Efron family, and the Efron family ended up hosting my grandfather for two and a half years, which is, uh, that story is captured in the book. He goes to meet them at a hotel lobby in central Manhattan. I wasn't sure where, what hotel this was, but I sort of researched and I found this beautiful picture of the Algonquin Hotel in Manhattan. It's on West 44th Street. And I found these, there was plenty of image, and then he, 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 he then has to go and find the Efron's at their uh, apartment in the Bronx, and he gets on the subway for the first time. And again, he is just so amazed and in awe of New York. And we really wanted to capture that in the book. So again, I was finding images online uh, to support this. And in a funny kind of way, I was reliving his journey by drawing out the scenes um, and then getting my illustrator uh, Brian to, to, to draw them out. And as you can see, these two scenes um, of him being in the lobby of the Algonquin and then being on the subway were taken from those photographs. Another thing early on in the book is he, he it's, his, it's September 1939, and he, he has this need to go to a, a synagogue uh, for Rosh Hashanah. He, he came from a traditional Jewish background in, in, in England, and, and you know, that was that was felt like the natural thing to do. He didn't particularly have a pleasant experience of going to that synagogue. <laughs> again, I, I didn't specifically know which synagogue, and again, that was part of the fun of researching the book. So we chose the Park Avenue Synagogue um, in Manhattan. And again, a beautiful picture of the facade of the building um, is captured there. Um, and again, the interior of the building I wanted to capture as well. Um, and these decisions happen time and time again 
during the book. So if you read the book, you'll see that there's lots of scenes of New York. And really, I really wanted to capture the magic of New York in the 1940s. What, a, what, a, what an incredible place to be at that time. Um, my book is very much a frame by frame account of his journey from a young, innocent schoolboy in September 1939 through to him becoming a GI. Um, in his early years, Bernard settled in New York. He went to the Straben Muller Textile High School in Chelsea uh, in Manhattan. And a year later, he began his studies at New York University. And over time, he became very settled in New York. And uh, he, you know, he missed his family greatly, but he discovered the theater and, and, and his life really was exciting, um, uh, but, uh, but very different. He was coming of age. But of course, life was to then, there's lots of turning points in the book. And of course, as we all know, December 1941, that was another turning point, Pearl Harbor. Uh, America entered the war. Um, but that didn't necessarily have an immediate impact. Um, uh, one the, Before Pearl Harbor, the USA draft required men between the ages of 21 and 45 to register. So Bernard was OK. But then on the 30th of June, 1942, men between the ages of 18 and 20, born between the 1st of July, 1922, and the same date in 1924, were required to register. So that was that was his time. Um, so just over 80 years ago, my grandfather was actually spending the summer in Washington, D.C. Um, he was in a sweaty office. Uh, he was doing a summer job, and that's where he registered for the Army. And I, I did manage to find, um, eventually from the Jewish Welfare Board, um, his, his, his registration uh, card um, on, uh, as part of the research for the book. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's his actual certificate. Um, but then, you know, he registered for the army and then he went back to university. It wasn't, there wasn't um, an immediate call up. Um, it wasn't until February, 1943. So we're quite a way through the war um, that he reported to Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic training. Um, and that basic training lasted 11 weeks. I was able to find these fabulous photographs or postcards of Fort Dix again, provided great inspiration for the book. Um, and this was, these, photo, these photographs was uh, during World War II in Fort Dix when people arrived for their induction. Um, for the most part of uh, 1943, um, he was actually, uh, after his basic training, he went into something called the, the ASTP, which was, uh, he was training, uh, the, the army put in place a program to train people to become engineers. Um, and this was a, 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 a program that include, included the likes of Mel Brooks, Bob Dole, Henry Kissinger. They were all part of the ASTPers. Um, and um, during, during this period, he, he, was, he, he met some of his closest friends. These are two of his best friends from his time in the army, um, uh, Sig Gruberger and Herb Shepard both Jewish uh, people from New, New York. Um, and this was a photograph of them at Penn State. Um, and they moved all around the US at that time. They moved uh, from North Carolina to Penn State to Vermont. And they worked hard and they played hard. Um, they were having a good time. They were safe and they were getting educated. Um, my grandfather recalls going away to Montreal for the weekend. They were away from the horrors of Europe, North Africa and the Pacific. I, I, I get the impression from reading other memoirs, I don't think they were expecting to be fighting anytime soon. So this was, uh, but then suddenly there was another turning point in the story. Um, early on in February of 1944, uh, the ASTP program was suddenly stopped. It was disbanded. Uh, there was a shortage of troops um, and the army needed reinforcements. And suddenly um, they were sent, uh, Bernard was sent, one, one day he was studying and the next day he was sent to Tennessee for maneuvers and then on to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And some of the training he was involved with over the next few weeks and months were some of the most brutal. And he writes about it in the book. I'll just read you a very short paragraph of a letter he wrote to my 
grandmother, uh, um, Toby. This is the story of a hike. It's the story of a thousand men walking 30 miles after a day's work. It's the story of guts and agony and tiredness. On Friday morning, we got up at 5.45 a.m. as usual. We'd worked hard all day. And at 6, p 6 p.m., we ate chow, as we usually do. And then the hike was over at 4 a.m. We had all worked for over 22 hours without sleep. We were tired, parched, sore, disgusted, and scared. We are the infantry. And if anyone says that the infantry is not the finest, toughest, greatest outfit in any army, I will punch his nose hard. The speed we worked was incredible. The second 50 minutes we covered in four and a half miles. So just, and this was a, a, a quoted from a letter that he'd written at the time. So it just shows you the, really gets a good insight into how he was feeling. Um, so he spent the next few months at, at Fort Bragg. Um, and then it was late August when Bernard uh, and the 26th Infantry returned to New York. Um, they actually returned to Camp Shanks in Orangeburg, uh, just over the over the um, uh, over the Hudson River. Um, Camp Shanks in Orangeburg was the last piece of American soil that most soldiers saw before setting out to liberate Europe. Um, it was the largest World War II embarkation camp on America's east coast for soldiers heading for the front lines. Um, and then there was quite an emotional scene he talks about in the book um, about his last night um, and he, he's saying goodbye to my grandma. Um, it, at the time, of course, they 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 weren't, they were just a boyfriend and girlfriend. And it, was a, it was a very emotional departure. A lot of uh, soldiers had that 24 hour pass and some went out to the stage door canteen um, on Broadway. Uh, this was a theatrical night spot where GIs could enjoy high class entertainment free of charge. Um, and I've got had pictures of Ethel Merman. Uh, again, I had re read other memoirs from people and just, just to try and capture that those final 24 hours. Um, but it was the 27th of August, 1944. Bernard was part of a convoy of 100 ships that left New York Harbor, setting sail for France to fight and hopefully win the war. They would be the first infantry men to sail directly from the US into France. He then was later to serve in, uh, the campaign was in between D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. It was called the Brutal Lorraine Campaign. Um, and he provided a lot of details in the book, but there were a few gaps that needed filling. Um, and I'll sort of delve into some of the memoirs that I also read. Um, Reading the other people's memoirs was actually some one of the most fascinating experiences for me, and it's just a little bit of regret um, that I can't discuss these with my with my grandfather. Um, and I said, reading the other memoirs were great because they corroborated um, his story and they enhanced the story. Um, so they had this journey, this eleven day journey from the United States to France. Um, but one of the most um, major uh, discoveries I had from my research was from a soldier named Victor Lundy. Uh, I don't think I don't think that Lundy was Jewish. He was from New York. Um, Lundy uh, became a notable architect after the war um, in Sarasota. He, he now lives in Dallas. He's still alive. He's ninety nine years old. Lundy created hundreds of evocative sketches of his life at war, and a few years ago, Lundy donated these amazing sketches to the Library of Congress. So one of his sketches is here, um, and this is them departing. It's, this is just, it says August 20, 26, 1944, 10 minutes from home. And yeah, this is such a, even if it's a simple sketch, this is Lundy drawing it on the ship. I just felt I had to use this as the front cover for the book. Um, I just think it's, it's just a, such an amazing, impactful um, uh, sketch of, 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 of his experience. Um, and there were plenty more the sketches. And again, I, I use these as inspirations. So rather than using photographs at the point, I could use some of Lundy's sketches uh, you know, just to get the, the an idea of what it was like on the ship. 
Um, and then they arrived in uh, in Normandy on the 7th of September. My grandfather said had it in his diary and all the all the dates arrived in sep September the 7th, 1944. And then here I see the sketchbook and and uh, Lundy has the exact same dates, September the 7th, 1944. And again, I had to use these in the in the graphic novel. Um, so this was this was probably my um, most uh, extraordinary discovery. Um, but as I say, having having this um, was particularly useful. Um, so another um, major discovery for me was um, I managed to find uh, uh, the diaries or the letters of a soldier called Benjamin Kaplow. Benjamin Kaplow um, died in 2011. Um, and um, his wife found a stash of letters in the loft um, uh, after he died. And she read these letters, and these are really incredible letters. And um, she donated the letters to the Jewish History Museum in Philadelphia in 2012, I think. Um, and uh, you can, the, the letters are, there's an online archive. And I, I've, part of my research, I found these letters. And, and one of the, the letters that I, I saw was he, he described what Rosh Hashanah was like in September 1944. They'd arrived in France um, and um, uh, they, they, um, they, they said that there was no Jewish chaplain. So the service was led by a private first class who knew what to do. Um, again, you know, these details my grandfather did not mention in his memoir, but I felt like, you know, this was the same. It was an, it was part of the 26th Division. This was too good an opportunity not to mention in the book. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, they there's an, also another scene where they they use a trumpet instead of a shofar for uh, for, for Rosh Hashanah. So that's uh, that was also uh, worth mentioning in the book. Um, Another memoir was from uh, Robert Kotlovitz. Um, Robert Kotlovitz, after the war, uh, became a, an acclaimed New York author and television producer. And in 1999, he wrote his memoir before their time. It's actually recently, they played it, one of his interviews on NPR on Veterans Day. Um, and um, in that interview, and also in his book, um, uh, um, Robert Kotlovitz, was was uh, told the interviewer uh, and in his memoir about his huge anxieties he had uh, about having an H for Hebrew on his dog tags and the concern about what would happen to him if he was captured by the German army. Now, I do not know for sure whether Bernard had an H on his dog tags. I suspect he probably did. Um, I I do did some some research found that some Jewish servicemen did debate whether to declare themselves as Jews for this purpose or whether to use a C for Catholic or P for Protestant. Um, the other option, of course, was an H for Hebrew. Uh, the H on your dog tag could make you a target, but of course, not having a dog tag uh, at all could also put you in jeopardy. You 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 could have been accused of being a spy. So it really was a, a, a big dilemma. I wish. My grandfather had mentioned that in his book, but as I said, as, as Kotlovitz had mentioned it, I, I felt that, again, this had to be mentioned in the book. Um, he's involved, my, my grandfather was involved in, and, and, and again, it's it's in much more detail in the book than in this presentation, but they they move over from Normandy over to, to the, the Western Front uh, under Patton's uh, Third Army, and they were involved in, in heavy combat duties, and, and it's a pretty horrific time he had. Um, uh, it was, not only was it horrific uh, combat conditions, it was also, um, uh, it was also, the weather was terrible. They said during the first week of November, the only thing holding the Third Army back was the inclement weather. And to make things worse, there were shortages of galoshes and waterproof sh shoe packs, and it caused an epidemic of trench foot. Um, the 26th Division alone reported 3,000 cases of trench foot during the November offensive. And this is, is again, I, I, I'm always amazed, but there is actually a lot of photographs of the war. Um, and again, this is the 26th Division, and, and this is in Metz, not far from where my grandfather was fighting. So 
again, I mean, this this does provide really good imagery for the book, for an, an inspiration for the artist. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary that these photographs do exist. Um, and again, the, the, this is more photographs of, um, as we said, the, the really, really terrible conditions. Um, now, my grandfather was was involved in fighting, heavy fighting for, for that month, October, November. Um, and he he I mean he'd be the first to say he 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 was very fortunate. He got injured in, in a in a very simple incident and he he was sent to hospital in Paris and um he was then uh transferred over to England. Um but I think having this uh, uh that one of the other memoirs that I read was from another Jewish soldier, uh, David Markov. David Markov was also, uh, I said, he's also Jewish, and he wrote in his memoir that he suffered from trench foot. He was also hospitalized in Paris. Um, and there was quite an amusing quote in his book. He said, to make matters worse, Markov wrote, in the hospital, he came upon an article in the Stars and Stripes newspaper under the heading, No Purple Heart for Purple Feet. Uh, Markov noted his displeasure with the article. But he did go on to say that it was written by a desk journalist who mercifully for them had no idea whatsoever about the reality of combat conditions. I think there was generally a skepticism about trench foot at the time. Um, but that was my grandfather's uh, uh, way out in a, in a sense. He, he did he suffered from that for, for about three months. And there is um, a remarkable reunion with his family uh, when he when he returns to England, he doesn't return to to Yorkshire. He returns to Bournemouth in the south of England, and there is a little bit of a story about how they actually find each other um, in the book. Um, but it was it was an emotional reunion after after about six years that they'd been separated. Um, now he was incredibly fortunate to survive um, uh, this period. Um, sadly, lots within the twenty sixth division were killed. Uh, he did mention one person, John Ebert, um, uh, who was killed. And I, I did some research about this. Um, I, I wanted to learn a little bit about John Ebert's background. Um, and I discovered there's an organization called Stories Behind the Stars, set up by somebody called Don Milne from Louisville, Kentucky. And Stories Behind the Stars has a mission. It wants to create and document the stories of all 416,000 US soldiers whose lives were lost in World War II. And he's got a team of volunteers. And the aim is to have all of these obituaries written by 2025, the anniversary of VE Day. Uh, they've had quite a lot of media coverage in the US recently, especially with um, it be recently being Veterans Day. Um, so I wanted to ensure that a biography was written about John Ebert. My grandfather had mentioned him in the book. Um, I managed to find someone called Hudson Louie, a student from Medina, Ohio, um, and he did some research and, and he wrote the obituary. Um, and we even got an article written in the uh, Bridgeport uh, paper. It was called The Times Leader in Ohio, and there was uh, had some coverage about the book. And um, so I was really, and even a member, I got a message on Facebook from a member of Johnny Ebert's family to say that they, how, how touched they were that he was mentioned. Um, Sadly, uh, he was uh, almost 21 years old when he when he was killed. So um, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about um, my great grandfather. Uh, when I set out to do this book, it was the 1939-1945 um, story uh, was really the main focus of the book. But I think every Jewish family during World War II has a wider story. Um, now, Bernard's father, um, Jaime Sandler, um, he came from a town called Ludza in Latvia. And he left, La uh, he left Latvia in 1910 and arrived in England age 17. Ironically, the same age that Bernard had left to go to the United States. And he arrived in England. He didn't speak any English. Um, and he became a very successful businessman in England and a popular figure in the wider community. It was a great story of assimilation. Um, but World War, but um, it was it was um, in 1937. Jaime had not seen his parents or his brothers in Latvia in 27 years. So this was this was two years before um, the outbreak of the war. 
And he took Bernard on this epic trip back to, to Latvia. And I capture this story in the book as a sort of a flashback. Um, it's prompted by the Russian invasion of uh, the, the, or the German invasion of Russia in 1941 and his fear for his family. But you know, this, this, this journey, um, and it was also a remarkable journey that Bernard went on when he was 15. I had to capture in the book. And again, it's doing some research on, on Latvia. And there, this is Jaime with his two brothers who were sadly killed during the war. Um, Jaime in 1937 wanted to persuade his Latvian family um, to come back to England with him, but they were reluctant to do so. Uh, they thought that they would be safer in Latvia. Um, so World War II, um, so just uh, during this trip to Latvia, again, I did a little bit more research for the book. So they go to this town in Ludza. Um, it's about 200 miles from Riga. And they go to the synagogue on the Shabbat in Riga, uh, in Ludza. And remarkably, this synagogue uh, still exists. It was recently restored. And I managed to find images of it online. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I was just so fortunate. You know, my grandfather describes this emotional trip back to Ludza and how emotional it was for his father to be in the synagogue and to be greeted by everyone who hadn't seen in 27 years. And then to be able to draw that scene out was, 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 was fantastic. Um, but yeah, World War II was, was a very difficult time for my great grandfather. So he had a son in the United States. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. Um, but he also had his, this is a picture in 1937 of his mother. Um, and uh, these were four of his nieces and nephews. Um, and they had quite a, a, a journey in the, in the Second World War. Um, and I write about their, their fate. Uh, it was a mixed fate. So the, his two brothers, uh, Jaime's two brothers, were killed in fighting for the Russian army during World War II. Remarkably, his grandma, sorry, uh, well, this would be Bernard's grandma, Jaime's mother. Remarkably, she survived. She was sent to the gulags. Um, and you can see the how much that would have, you know, the, the 10 years between 1937 and 1947, how much that would have aged her. But it was it was amazing that she came back to Latvia after the war and survived. Um, but there are, sadly, um, two uh, of the children in the photograph on the left did not survive. Uh, they were killed in the Shoah. Um, so that was, um, I, I felt, a really important story that had to also be mentioned in the book. Um, so I also have to mention, um, uh, it was also a, a, a romance story, the book. Um, my my, my uh, grandfather met my grandma, um, Toby Barish. Um, they met at New York University in 1940. Um, and Toby Barish was a fine arts student, uh, and together they discovered a love for the theater and the arts scene. And they said that period between 1940, 1942, they just had such a great time in New York, just discovering, discovering the world. My grandma uh, was a New York born and bred. Uh, her parents were originally from Galicia. Um, our parents, Manny Barish and Esther Wiesen, uh, they grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. They were married in the early 1920s, and they moved to Bell Harbor, far Rockaway in Long Island. Um, and my grandmother and her brother David, they grew up in far Rockaway. Um, and then I said my my grandma, uh, so Toby met Bernard in 19, during the early 1940s. And um, when Bernard came back to New York um, after his injury, they, uh, after a short amount of time, when the war was over and uh, Bernard was discharged from the army, they they got married in 1945, August 1945, at Temple Emanuel Synagogue in Manhattan, um, which was which was a lovely lovely ending to to this story. Um, my 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 grand, I think it's the, the the whole process. I felt I got to know my grandfather all over again. He was very fortunate in the sense that he moved on from the war. He came back, they came back to live in England. Um, 
the family had a business and he, he had a he had a really close bond with his family and and it really picked off where it left off um whilst bernard was a businessman his main passion in life was the arts and the theater inspired inspired by early 1940s new york and he founded in 1969 1970 the leeds playhouse which was um quite a feat in those days uh, which is Leeds Play was a was a big theatre in and it's still around in Leeds. And uh you see um there's a picture of him with Prince Charles. Prince Charles when uh, opened the theatre in, in in 1970. So it's a nice to think that that was only 25 years after he was in the in in uh, fighting in the US Army. You know, it just shows you how that the greatest generation just moved on and, and went on to do such great things. Um and that's him meeting Princess Anne. Um, uh, but it's interesting. My, uh, there is an anecdote. My grandfather, um, had a, a great life in the theater as well, but he, he had an interest, some interesting friendships, but one of them, I just want to draw an anecdote is he met, he became friendly with Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl, of course, is the famous author and provocateur. Um, uh, and, um, cause Roald, they, they, he was, Bernard was a producer and Roald Dahl was a playwright and uh, they, they worked together on a few things. Um, and uh, just for, whilst we're doing research for the book, we did find some papers. Um, and my grandfather had written just before he died. And he describes his friendship with Dahl uh, between 1977 and 1983. And they dined in each other's homes and enjoyed each other's companies until 1983 when he discovered that Roald Dahl was actually a raving anti-Semite. Uh, Roald Dahl was interviewed by a British newspaper, and he shockingly said that Jews didn't fight in World War II for the Allies. I mean, it's just an absolutely outrageous statement. Um, and uh, this was, of course, before social media and Twitter, so he sort of got away with it. Uh, Roald Dahl phoned up my grandfather the next day for, for, for a chat, my grandfather answered the phone and he said to him, how can someone with such intelligence say something so stupid? And he slammed down the phone and they never spoke again. Um, my grandfather um, lived to the, say, the age of uh, 75. Um, he was very, very close to his family. Um, and this is a picture of my great um, grandmother Celia at her 90th birthday in 1988 and uh yeah it's a, it's a lovely picture sadly my grandma Toby died a, a number of years earlier so she wasn't in the photo but yeah this was everybody uh, and it's a really a, a nice sort of ending to the book um so yeah this is uh that sort of concludes my presentation I think you're on mute Michael yeah um Thanks, Jonathan. It was great. Um, can we go back to the uh, the decision to for him not to go home with the uh, with the other schoolmates? Um, do we know much about that? And then was there much of an effort for him to get back to England in from thirty nine until until the war begins? So it's an it, I, I, and that was one of the first questions I wanted to examine in a little bit more detail. I think his parents took a almost a strategic decision. They thought that. It just wasn't worth, it, it was too risky for him to come back. Now, there is one other person he mentioned in the book, um, somebody called Roy Simon. And they, uh, Roy Simon went out to, with him on that same trip. And I managed to get in touch with his children. And I found out that Roy Simon actually did come back to England. And he ended up serving in the uh, Royal Navy um, for the British Army. So my grandfather's life could have been so different um, if it wasn't for his parents making that decision. So I think they they had to they had to make a decision. And there was a very um, interesting piece I, I read um, in in th there was a lot of evacuees um, from Britain to the United States around about 1940, more of school children, because families you know they knew that the war was coming um, and they wanted to get some children out. But there was um, one of the boats taking. Uh, the the children from Britain to America was sunk by U-boats. So it, that proved it was a genuine risk 
uh, to have uh, to, to to be sunk going across the Atlantic. And the family he stays with in New York. They were just friends, correct? What, what what was that relationship? So that's interesting. So so they they, they were called the family and Jack Efron. Um, my grandfather didn't mention too much about them after the 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 war, and and I I think they sort of lost touch. I did manage to. <laughs> Through research, find um, the son. That the, 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 there, there was a three-year-old son mentioned in the book, and he's drawn in the book. And and he was born. Uh, I said it would have been David Efron, born in 1937. And I, I managed to find an obituary of him. He lived in Chicago, and I I, I wrote to his wife and told him the story, and she didn't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, so I sort of, unfortunately. David died in 2017. Um, I was a few years too late. So we didn't know too much. Well, what I do know is that they were atheists. Um, they were, they just had a very different, they were sort of had a more socialist outlook on life and, and actually influenced my grandfather in his in his political outlook. Um, I mean, they took him on for two and a half years. It was just an extraordinary act of generosity. But I think it was at times quite a difficult relationship just because, um, you know, <laughs> if you can imagine just just somebody being thrown into your life. But, you know, just with what's going on with the Ukraine war at the moment, where a lot of British families are taking refugees. It's 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 quite an interesting story. Yeah. So you do include uh, in the book him choosing to go to synagogue when he's staying with those atheists and, and not enjoying the experience. And uh, we have a question from Doris Ross Strauss in the Q and A. Uh, what made his synagogue experience unpleasant besides missing his family? Well, is he? It says in the book that he was asked. He had he booked his seat and he was asked to move seats. <laughs> That's that was the one of the things he wrote down. So, I think it was probably one of these sort of high end synagogues in in Manhattan, and you know he was just a, a shy seventeen year old boy. And, that was the experience he had. Yeah, and you do contrast that some with with him finding some Jewish community in the army, and and, and you include the stuff on the services. So uh, he was more comfortable in in that environment. Yeah, I mean that that was more for illustrative purposes. Um, as I said, I never actually got any definitive. Um, I don't know whether he, 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 that was his experience, but I think you know generally he. He he had such good friends in the army. I just felt that that was that was a good sort of parallel to draw. Uh, here's a question from a, an anonymous question. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran, and he experienced anti-Semitism. Did your grandfather experience anti-Semitism? It's a not. It's a it's a question um, that I've been asked before, and I I just don't know the answer. I I suspect he would have mentioned it um, in his book. Um, you know, he he does talk about the real uh, the the anti-Semitism in or the the fears of of the, of the anti-semitism in 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 England in 1939 so i'd have thought he would have mentioned it but what what the one um area i probably would have loved to have researched more is is what that feeling was like between 1939 and 1941 in the united states pre well before the united states had entered world war 2 um i was recently watching the philip roth um uh, there was a, a, a it was an ad adaptation of his book, um, and you know that that could have that was presumably quite a frightening period because um, he just didn't. I mean, yeah, you know, he does write in the book. He didn't know whether Britain was going to you know, you know, win the war or, or, or survive uh, the 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 German invasion. So there was a genuine a genuine risk at that time. But no, in terms of anti-Semitism, uh, he doesn't uh, mention that. So he did go through with uh, getting American citizenship. He had dual citizenship, I believe. Um, did yeah. So yeah, he he was. It was when he was at Penn uh, University. It was when he was in the ASTP. He got a tap on the shoulder one day and uh, said, "You've got to go down to the courthouse." And he swore allegiance to to the United States. I think it was part of the rules. Um, I, I suspect there's less bureaucracy than there would be nowadays if, in 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 uh, organizing something like that. But yeah, he became. A U.S. citizen, and after the war, he, he is entitled to the GI, all of the benefits of the GI Bill of Rights. His university fees were paid for at New York University after the war. So they they returned to England in a, a year or so after the war. Yeah, they returned in uh, 1946. So they they went back to New York um, for a year, and and then and then returned to to England. 
although my grandma had never been to England, uh, that this was the start of an adventure for her. But for 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 my for my grandfather, he 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 really wanted to to return home. Do you think he maintained any kind of an American identity for the, for the rest of his life in England? Oh, I mean, my my grand whilst they they moved to um, England, um, my grandfather was incredibly close to all of his relatives, all my all my grandma's relatives in the United States, um, and he maintained that relationship even after my grand grandmother died. He, he was he would have visited he visited the United States every year. He was a big um, and and of course one of his favorite place to visit was New York City. I mean, he would. In his later years, he would go every year to New York, um, uh, and you know, going to Broadway was was his main passion. Uh, here's a, I guess, a comment from Sarah Adler. Uh, this is a somewhat similar story. My grandfather was also caught by the outbreak of war, having gone to see his brothers in New York in 1938 and booked to return on the Queen Mary in September 1939. He ended up working for a Jewish company in New York until 1943. Greetings, Jonathan from Mill Hill. Very interesting. Well, that was so. So, my grandfather was due to go back on the Queen Mary in in um, uh, September uh, nineteen thirty nine, and that was the boat that he. So, it does sound like there's a there's a parallel in that story. So, I'd be interested to, to find out more, Sarah Adler, <laughs> on your in your family story. That's in, very interesting. Yeah, uh, there's a. Uh... Rivka Yerushalami is uh, an offer for you to speak for the Association of Jewish Libraries. So we will make that uh, connection for you. Uh, Gary Glick, uh, we're in Rockaway. Where was he living and when? Do you know much about his time in uh, Rockaway? Sorry, my, 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 my internet just cut off for, for a few moments. Yeah, we have a, a, a Gary Glick says, we're in Rockaway. Was he living in when? And uh, do you know much about that, that part of the story? Rockaway? No, I mean, Wait. that's, um, they, they lived in, in, in this, uh, my, my grandfather, my, my, would have been my great grandfather, Manny Barish. He, he moved to, to, from the Lower East Side to live in Far Rockaway in the, in the 1920s. He was an accountant there and he lived in this, in this house by the beach um in um Bar Rockaway for his whole life. He died in 1988 at the age of 96. Um uh but he my grandfather described what a what a lovely place to live because it was only 45 minutes from Manhattan, yet you were by the by the beach. But yeah, uh, I didn't know too much about it. I I I never got to visit myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh Sylvia Squire Sylvia Squire, not a question, uh, but she's in London and has ordered your book. I should point out we we have the book uh, here in our museum store and and can get it in person or order it on the website. Any other anything else you want to impart to people who might want to buy the book? Best way to get it? Yeah, I just look online. The English GI World War II graphic memoir. It's available on Amazon and uh, both in in the UK, US, or anywhere in the world. I'm curious about the uh, the Latvian family. Did that? Did he ever explicitly make the connection between being a soldier, the war effort, fighting the Germans, and what was going on with the Holocaust and, and with his family? Was that uh, connection explicit? Uh, yeah, he he he. It was in 1941, um, and he was reading the newspapers about the Russian invasion, um, and he. You know, sometimes, you know, you would have had family in Eastern Europe and it may not mean too much to you because you haven't met them. But because he he had been on this visit in 1937 to visit his grandma and all his family, it really meant something to him. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 you know, he wouldn't have known what had happened to him. But I think, you know, that was in some ways most Jewish families would have had a similar story in in in, in some ways. My grandfather went to Latvia again in 1994 with one of my cousins. Um, and he made that made that trip all, all over again. There was one remaining relative there. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the Latvian story was 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 really, you know, he felt quite deeply about that story. Yeah, so I'm just uh if we can just finish up with one more and we're going back to I was looking at the uh the draft card, the draft registration card from 1942 when he was here in D.C. and uh, looking at both the uh, home address and work address, both just a few miles from where uh, I'm sitting right now. 
And, uh, you know, very interesting that there's the, the line on the draft card for a name and address, a person who will always know your address. And he writes on there, Mrs. Levinson, Mrs. Levinson, I'm not quite sure what the name is, uh, full name not known. So it's just kind of an interesting uh, statement. Yeah, his, uh, that must have been his landlady or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah so he, the person. He, he had a summer little, job in he had a summer job in Washington D.C. and yeah, that was. It, it, yeah. I mean, I found that draft card online, uh, which was amazing. Uh, so it's it's there's there's so much you know, and again, I, I I think one of the messages of the book, you know, this is my grandfather's story. Everybody has a story, and I'm not a historian. I didn't uh, a lot of the research. In fact, most of the research I did was just just by being quite uh, innovative online and, and finding things. Um, there was, you know, even one of the soldiers he served with, um, Sig Gruberger, I managed to locate um, his daughter through the sorts of research and ancestry.com and there's all sorts of ways. So I just encourage anyone um, to try and, you know, th there's always leads out there for, for doing research. How's the response been to, to the graphic novel format as a way of telling the story? Well, that's that's the other message. So, I, I there's a the the number of times people have bought this book and have said this is the first time I've read a graphic novel. I didn't realize. Oh, I thought they were for kids, and uh, I was just they were quite amazed by it. So, so I think um, if you've never read a graphic novel, uh, I think the English GI is a good good starting point. Uh, but there are there's a whole genre out there of really uh, interesting books. Obviously, Mouse is the is, is up there as one of the best ones, but you know, the, the, it, I, I think um, people have been really receptive to it as, as a as a as a way of uh, telling a story. Okay, so I think we can finish up there. Uh, any final words, Jonathan? No, as I said, uh, if you've not read a graphic novel before, this is a great one to do. And and you know, out there, please do your family research. You never know uh, what's what you might find. And you know, as I said it's more the Children now it's the children, grandchildren, great grandchildren of those that are fighting are are, are, are now telling those stories. So it's really important to for everyone to find those stories and retell them. Okay, so we did record this, and we'll send out a, a link to the recording to everyone who registered, and it will also include links to buy the book. And thank you, Jonathan. Thank everyone for being on, and uh, we'll be back. We're doing another one of these next week on uh, Vietnam with uh, Harvey Weiner and John Rashke. So that should be a fascinating uh, book talk the same time Thursday at three. So we hope to see some, some of you back and thank you for being on. Thank you.